sitting here with Donald, Donald Robertson, originally from Scotland, but uh, living in Kine Canada uh, at this moment. Not this moment, but you're be, uh, uh -huh. being transformed to a Canadian. Yeah, I became a Canadian citizen recently. Hmm. How yeah. does that feel? Oh, I feel completely transformed, yeah. Patrick. Like, I feel like a new man inside. <laughs> Why Canada? Why Canada? Well, it was just kind of family reasons. I wanted hmm. a bit of a change, actually. And, you know, I'd been living in England for a long time. I worked in London for a long time. So yeah. it didn't seem like that much of a, an upheaval to me to, to move to another country again. Nothing to do with Brexit? No, it wasn't. I've done my own Brexit. Yeah. <laughs> broke. I'm ahead of the curve. Yeah, I broke away myself. Yeah, yeah. Um, you've been a psychologist. Uh -huh. Yeah. And uh, you train people. There are some meditations by you on, um, yeah. on SoundCloud. Uh -huh. And now you have a new book. Uh -huh. Learn to think like a Roman emperor uh -huh. this one here. Yeah. yeah and it's been translated in dutch I'm, uh -huh. I'm guessing you didn't do the translation yourself no i didn't i can barely pronounce the dutch title actually mm. but uh i'm gonna have to <laughs> learn yeah but i'm really pleased that it's out in dutch actually and um, it's a it's a pleasure to be in amsterdam uh, talking about the book mm -hmm. and, uh, it's it's uh, about this guy who was on the front of mm -hmm. this uh, uh the cover marcus uh -huh. aurelius marcus aurelius yeah yeah what, what, what's this guy about? Why is he so fascinating to you? <clears throat> well, the, it's the philosophy that he represents. So not only was he a Roman emperor, a very successful one, um, a very highly regarded one, but also he was a, a philosopher um, and a hi highly regarded as a Stoic philosopher. He's the last famous Stoic philosopher of the ancient world. And so that was really what attracted me to him because he provides us a living example of somebody who took this philosophy and tried to put it into practice on a daily basis. Mm. And this philosophy is the, the Stoicism. The st Stoic philosophy. Stoic Stoicism. Philosophy. Yeah. yeah. What's Stoicism about? What's it about? Well, it's an ancient Greek school of philosophy. It was founded in Athens in 301 BC and by a guy called Zeno, who was a Phoenician merchant. And it was influenced by the earlier philosophy of Socrates. So it's a kind of a spin-off of Socratic philosophy. And people may have heard of Socrates, even if they haven't heard of the Stoics. And the, the Stoics believed that virtue, or excellence of character, mm -hmm. is the only truly good thing in life. It's the most important thing in life. And they thought that other things like health and wealth and reputation are of some importance, but they're trivial compared to wisdom and strength of character and that really goes back to an old argument that comes from socrates and socrates said look things like health and wealth and reputation and all these external things that people chase after in life are only really good insofar as we use them wisely so if you give money to a foolish or wicked person they'll use it to do foolish and wicked things mm. but the wise man the good man or woman uses everything well and even adversity, even misfortune, they may use well, constructively. Mm. And, and so Socrates said, well, therefore, surely wisdom is the only truly good thing in life. And it, it makes everything else potentially good. And, and foolishness is the only truly bad thing in life. It potentially turns every opportunity bad as well. And so the Stoics took that idea and they really developed it into a, a whole philosophy of life. Yeah. And there are some quite famous people who uh, uh, are fond of this uh, philosophy, uh -huh. like I name a Bill Clinton. I, he, yeah. He reads books about this. Yeah, there are some politicians. Bill Clinton read The Meditations, which is the book that Marcus Aurelius wrote. And even there are actually probably more Republican politicians in America who are into Marcus Aurelius and the Meditations. General Mattis, who is the former Secretary of Defense under President Trump was a big fan of Marcus Aurelius as well. So on, on both sides of the political spectrum in the States, there are people influenced by this philosophy. Yeah. And a Goethe? Goethe, yeah. Yeah, yeah was uh, influenced by Stoicism as well. And also uh, here uh, in, in the Netherlands, Spinoza, the philosopher, was also influenced uh, by the Stoics. Yeah. Have yeah. you been to his house? Because I read somewhere that you were... Uh... Yeah, we're planning to go. I'm very excited about yeah. that because I haven't been before. So I'm looking forward to that. Spinoza is a famous figure over here, but still there are some people, uh, mostly in the Catholic Church, who are not so fond of him. Oh, yeah. Because uh, the, he said quite some things about God and religion. And how, how, is, how, how was Marcus Aurelius uh, 
in terms of, of religion. It, it was a couple of hundred years after Christ died. Uh -huh. was, he, was he doing something with that? Well, see, the Stoics actually, in, in some ways similar to Spinoza, Spinoza was actually excommunicated by the, the Jewish community yeah. um, because he said, uh, Dia sive natura. He said, God and nature are basically the same thing. And the Stoics had a very similar belief, um, but it didn't cause quite as much controversy. It caused some controversy in the pagan world before Christianity, but not as much controversy. It, it was more of a familiar concept in some ways. And Marcus, by his time, had reached a sort of compromise position where he he was actually the high priest of the Roman religion. That was a, an office that the, the emperor traditionally occupied. And Marcus was very interested in traditional religion, all sorts of pagan religion. Um, but he viewed it, as the other Stoics did, kind of metaphorically. Mm -hmm. So he, they didn't think that Zeus and the other Olympian gods literally existed as kind of bearded guys floating in the sky or whatever, this kind of mythological form of religion. They thought they were kind of symbols or metaphors for different aspects of nature. Mm. So they, they had a, a slightly more philosophical interpretation of what the rites and the symbols of religion meant. Mm. Um, Marcus would have been familiar with Christianity. He doesn't say a lot about it. He mentions it in passing. It hadn't risen quite. It was just beginning to rise to, to prominence in Rome. Um, but like many educated Romans, he, he kind of viewed Christianity, it seems, as a, a superstitious religion. Mm. Um, so the, at one point at the beginning of the meditations, he said he was glad that his philosophical teachers taught him not to be taken in by hucksters and magicians and people conducting exorcisms, which actually could only really have been Christians that he's oh, referring, referring to. to. Yeah. Um, how can we use those uh, thoughts and those uh, the philosophy that Marcus Aurelius uh, was found uh, or was very uh, enthusiastic about in our daily life you know let's say I'm stuck in traffic well I could talk all day about how yeah. we could use it I'll, I'll, let me tell you three things in answer to that question if I may yeah um, so the first is the first book that I wrote about this philosophy was comparing it to techniques that we have in modern psychotherapy and in that book I I identified 18 different psychological techniques that Marcus and the other ancient Stoics used. So there's like a whole bunch of different things that they yeah. did. Now, of all of those techniques, we might pick different ones to look at. I'll usually pick two of the most popular, most fundamental ones. So one of them is what we modern Stoics call the dichotomy of control. And that's this idea that some things are up to us or under our voluntary control and other things, in fact, everything else is not. It's a distinction between the things that we do and the things that merely happen to, to us. us. Yeah. And it's encapsulated in uh, a famous prayer that was popularized by Alcoholics Anonymous called the Serenity Prayer. that says, God, give me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. So that wasn't, as far as we know, directly derived from the Stoics, but it's so similar to one of their basic doctrines that it, it looks like it must have somehow been inspired by the Stoics. And the odd thing about that is, you know, this dichotomy of control, in a sense, it's stating the obvious to say some things are under our control and other things aren't. Mm -hmm. You'd think that we all know that already. It's kind of common sense. But I think the Stoics astutely observed that somehow there's something about human nature that causes us to blur this distinction. Uh, there's something about us that causes us to become confused about it so that we often end up banging our heads against the wall and trying to change things that aren't under our control. Mm -hmm. But likewise, we also tend to neglect taking ownership or responsibility or control for things that we potentially could change. Mm. And as a psychotherapist, I, I see many kind of concrete examples of that on a daily basis. So I think you mentioned as your example being caught in traffic. Yeah, it makes me very scared. <clears throat> when I'm caught in traffic, I, I immediately uh, looking for the exit. Yeah. You know, I think, oh, I'm stuck here. I can't get out. So the stoic in that situation, the first thing that they would do, there are many techniques that they might use, but the basic one 
would be to notice the things that they're getting upset or frustrated about mm. and ask themselves, is this up to me or is it not? Mm. Is it an action that I'm performing or is it something I'm observing or that's happening to me? Mm. And if it's something that's merely happening to me, I should learn to be more emotionally resigned and more accepting towards it, view it with a greater sense of detachment. But if it's something that I'm doing, I should take greater responsibility for it, ownership for controlling it. So in that situation, sometimes just sorting the wheat from the chaff, making a clearer distinction between things that lie within my sphere of control and things that don't, that in itself will, for many people, alleviate a a lot of their distress. But then I, I said that, I was going to mention three things. So one is that there's a lot of techniques. The other one is this dichotomy of control. And the third thing is is very famous in Stoicism as well. And it's famous because uh, it's a sentence from a book by Epictetus, one of the most famous Stoic philosophers, um, that says uh, it's not things that upset us, but our opinions about things. Yeah. And that became famous and it, it particularly grabbed me because the one of the founders of modern cognitive behavioural therapy in the 1950s, a guy called Albert Ellis, who was based in New York, um, he when he developed CBT, or cognitive therapy, he had originally been doing psychoanalytic therapy and became disillusioned with it. And they, a lot of great men, he said, I'm going to start again from scratch. I'm going to tear up everything and create a new psychotherapy from scratch. And he'd read the Stoics. Mainly he'd read Marcus Aurelius and Epictetus. And he took this idea and he made it one of the fundamental premises of cognitive therapy. We call it the cognitive theory of emotion. The idea that our feelings are shaped, if not entirely, at least largely, by underlying beliefs. And it's very important to modern therapy because in in traditional therapy, someone who's depressed or anxious, the therapist might question these feelings and say maybe they're unhealthy or maybe they're irrational. And someone might say, yeah, I know it doesn't make sense, but it's just the way I feel. Hmm. And that's a way of ending the conversation and kind of refusing to take responsibility Hmm. or to change. But the therapist like Ellis might say, well, actually, it's not just the way you feel. It's also the way you think. Hmm. because your feelings can't be separated from your thoughts. But still, when I'm at school, uh-huh. as a young kid, they expect me to form an opinion about the stuff that happens in uh-huh. in the world. You know, They yeah, ask, yeah. okay, today was an earthquake in Japan. What do we feel? What do we think about that? And everybody goes, oh, yeah, shouldn't that have happened? And who's responsible? Whatever, you know? Uh-huh. So do you mean to like have opinions about world events well, that are outside of your direct sphere it, of it's been it, It's been taught to me that I should have an opinion about the things yeah. that, that happen around me. Is that then maybe a wrong way of teaching? Well, this, what the Stoics would say, and this is the kind of sli- where their philosophy becomes a little bit more nuanced, they would say it's okay to assign some value to external events. So they have this technical jargon where they say um, that we have preferred or dispreferred Mm. indifference. And what they really mean in plain English, and they use this technical jargon to express it, is that it's okay to care about the external world. It's okay to care about the environment and world politics. It's okay to prefer one politician over another. As long as we don't care so strongly about it that we become distressed and frustrated and upset and in a way I feel that the essence of stoicism is actually striking this balance between caring about something but not becoming worked up in a lather and and upset about Mm. it so and that comes down to recognizing that we we want or we prefer it to be a different way but we recognize it's not directly under our control and that allows us to have just the right amount of detachment from it so that we're not completely indifferent to it okay but we're not kind of banging our head against the wall and struggling with things emotionally yeah i wrote down um some things i read about marcus aurelius uh, everything changes nothing is permanent that's something that has been said in buddhism in non-dualism uh, uh, could we say this this guy was really spiritual? Yeah, definitely, I would say. So, well, like I said, he was a high priest, right? Yeah. And very interested in religion. And the Stoic philosophy is a, you could view it as a very metaphysical or very spiritual um, philosophy of life. But I suppose when I talk to people that are into Stoicism, they tend to say to me, the reason that they got into it is that it's like Christianity in some ways. In fact, Christianity was 
influenced by Stoicism, inspired by it in certain respects, but they see Stoicism as not being based on faith, tradition, or revelation, but based on philosophical reasoning and arguments. So to many modern agnostics and atheists, it's a kind of rational spirituality, in a sense, that, that's more consistent with their worldview. And the other thing they tend to say is that it reminds them a bit of Buddhism or Hinduism, but it's like a Western version. Ah. And so for some people, that they're more comfortable with that yeah. because it fits in more with their existing cultural norms and values. Yeah. People are, uh, I would call it in English, uh, people make mistakes. This is no surprise. That, that would be a, a thing that, that uh, Marcus would have said. So don't get surprised by that yeah. people are being mad at you, jealous, uh, whatever. I'm really glad you mentioned that one. It's one of my favorites and it doesn't it doesn't come up that much, but one of the things about the Stoic sage or the, the, wise, the wise man or woman they call the Sophos or the sage is, so the Stoics like to ask this question, what would the ideal wise person look like? How would they respond? It's like a thought experiment they like to play to, to give themselves a sense of direction. And, and one of the things they say is, well, like the Sophos, the, the wise man or woman, wouldn't be surprised or shocked by as many things. And they very astutely observe that when people get upset, they often say, I can't believe this. I can't believe what that guy did. How could this have happened to me? And when we look at someone saying that, we think, but the thing that happened to you happens to other people in life. So they got their wallet stolen or their girlfriend or their boyfriend slept with somebody else. Yeah. Can't believe it! How could this possibly happen? So Stoics thought this is a kind of bogus surprise in a way, or we should kind of know better. Like, it may be that we weren't expecting it to happen on that occasion, but we should nevertheless know that things like that happen to yeah. other people in life. So if it's happened to other people, it shouldn't be a huge shock if it happens yeah. to me as well. So the, the Stoic wise man is kind of prepared for these things and less surprised by them. He has more of a kind of sale of attitude towards them. That That's how it is, uh, uh, attitude or um, without lows, no highs or... Yeah. Yeah. Um, he, he was part of the Roman Empire. I just looked it up on Wikipedia. That was quite an empire. Oh yeah, it was a huge <laughs> empire. Under Marcus, it stretched from the Atlantic, from, from Britain. Um, all the way to Syria, to into the Euphrates River mm. in the east, and from the the north, from the Danube and the Rhine, it stretched all the way across the Mediterranean to North Africa and mm. ended at the Sahara. I can so, imagine that he didn't get that by asking. <laughs> they, they had to fight for it. Yeah. Uh -huh. So we could. Do we see someone here who murdered people? Was he like a, a like a, a warrior and a soldier? He kind of was, and I, I like I have to qualify this by saying when we talk about the history, right? You could say we we might be idealizing Marcus because we only have a handful of historical accounts, and they're probably biased in some ways, and there's some contradictions and so on. But overall, Marcus is portrayed as an unusually wise, benign, merciful hmm. Roman emperor. He's not like Nero or Caligula or one of these kind of crazy, aggressive emperors. Um, he was renowned for avoiding political purges. He had, he was, throughout his reign, spent a lot of time engaged in warfare, but he wasn't a soldier by training. Unlike some other Roman noblemen, he hadn't served in the military, and it seems that he engaged in, in warfare reluctantly. Um, the two main wars that he fought were both instigated by first the Parthians and then several tribes in the northern frontier invading Rome's provinces or its allies, its client states. So he was responding to invasions from barbarians across the, the Roman frontier. Okay. And personally, I would say his way of dealing with those invasions was to try and stabilise the regions through diplomacy whereas other Romans probably were frustrated with them, they would have rather seen a, a more hawkish and a, aggressive response. Yeah. So uh, he was not like he's portrayed in Gladiator, that, 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 that he was watching all those bloody fights and with a smile. Oh, that's probably Commodus in Gladiator. Like, uh, he is in Gladiator at the beginning, um, Marcus Aurelius. He's played by Richard Harris, and then Joaquin Phoenix plays Commodus, his son, who was 
a bad emperor and, and much more kind mm. of violent. Actually, Marcus talks about the uh, the amphitheatre and the gladiatorial matches, and he he says that he doesn't like them. He finds he seems to find them cruel and tedious. Um, and supposedly during his lifetime he required that the gladiators fought with blunted weapons mm. um, so not all Roman emperors were bloodthirsty okay that's that's a good thing to have touched upon because you could think well yeah he, he can say it but did he practice it huh? did he just kill people for fun that was not the case if I uh, if I uh, as far as we can tell he, he didn't like that let me just tell you a little side note about yeah. that Ma we're told Children in the Roman world would dance on tight ropes to entertain the, the crowds at some of the festivals and so on. And Marcus introduced a law requiring them to have safety nets ah. because he thought they can dance, but it shouldn't be dangerous. Yeah. So he was, it seems, like a man who was concerned about people's safety and not bloodthirsty like some Romans. Okay, I, I hear a little noise. Do you have a phone with you or something? Or, uh, maybe we could put it on flight mode. Yeah, the, I, I I think there's something something a little uh, glad they didn't have mobile phones in the um, Roman Empire. <laughs> Maybe if we put okay. It Thanks. So, what is stress to you? Are you stressed sometimes? And what does stress you? Yeah, I think everybody gets stressed. It's natural to experience a certain amount of nervous arousal, and, and actually, even the Stoics way ahead of their time in recognizing that. And, and like the Stoics and modern cognitive therapy would say, what matters is how you respond to that initial stressful reaction. Hmm. The Stoics said, look, if someone walks up behind you and goes, boo, your blood pressure will shoot up and, and you'll get tense. Yeah. The same, there are many things in life that would naturally cause a, a stress reaction. Hmm. But what matters is whether you dwell on it and ruminate about it and make it worse by the way that you think about it. That's where you can exercise your voluntary control. Yeah. Change things. Um it's not your first book you wrote, no. What, what makes this book different from the earlier books? This is the sixth book that I've written and the, the others were on philosophy and psychotherapy. Um, I've written another book that's an introduction to Stoicism. It's called Stoicism and the Art of Happiness. And so I was asked to write another one and I thought, well, I can't. I've already done an introduction. There are other people writing introductory books. So I want to write a beginner's Guide to Stoicism, but somehow I need to make it different. And I decided to make it different by forming it around anecdotes and stories about a real historical individual. Because I figured the best way to learn about practicing Stoicism is to look at somebody who actually did it, like this guy here. And he happens to be the most famous person hmm. who practiced Stoicism. There were other ones. Sen Seneca? Seneca, also very famous. Epictetus, quite famous. Uh, Cato, another famous Roman statesman, but we know more about Marcus because he was emperor, so there are several histories of his reign, so o overall we, we have more details about his life and character. Yeah, and did the people, um, the, the Stoicists, do they believe in determinism? Uh, yeah. That you came today, was it always the case that it would happen, or did, was it just coincidence? The Stoics followed, had this metaphysical, sort of theological view called pantheism, so they believed that the, the universe as a whole, the whole of space and time is like a single organism and it's kind of a divine being and we're all like cells within its body or as Marcus puts it, like organs or limbs that are part of a greater whole. And they thought wisdom consists in always kind of looking at the bigger picture and trying to view our lives within this broader context of time and space, a kind of God's eye perspective on things the wise man or woman has. And part of that is that they view our lives as just like a small piece of this bigger jigsaw puzzle and is determined by all of the causes that precede it. So unlike Plato, who had this theory of forms, Plato believed there was a metaphysical world behind the scenes, as it were. The Stoics thought the material world was the only world, but it was sacred when we think of it in its totality. And they thought, therefore, there's no kind of sneaky way of influencing it from outside everything that happens is determined by the whole and by the events that precede mm. it so they were determinists but they were a type of determinist called a compatibilist so that means they believed in a sort of freedom but a freedom that's not incompatible with causal determinism so they thought to be free you don't have to be um free from 
causes that explain your behavior mm -hmm. you just have to be unobstructed from exercising your behavior yeah. so your hands aren't tied but there's an explanation for why you're acting the way that you do mm. the big question that always pops up in these kind of talks when i'm with a philosopher or with a non-dualist is there such a thing as free will then do do i make mistakes do i have a choice in what i do and what i don't I think this is a tricky philosophical question. Yeah. I'll tell you how I'll answer it, how yeah. the Stoics would answer it. So like I say, they're compatibilists. So they would say, look, freedom exists insofar as we can exercise our will without it being blocked or obstructed. <clears throat> If I try to walk to the other side of the room and there's no one tying my hands mm -hmm. or feet or blocking my way, then in this ordinary sense of the word, I have freedom. But freedom in a metaphysical sense, they would say, doesn't exist. I don't have freedom from prior causes. I don't yeah. have freedom from the the activity in my brain or my genetics or my upbringing. There are reasons that have led me to do the things that I do. Yeah. But normally when we, I talk about you being free to leave the room or free to vote, I don't mean that you have metaphysical freedom. I just mean that there isn't anyone stopping you. Yeah. So they said in this ordinary sense we have freedom. But there's also a more mysterious sense of freedom. The Stoics would say, look, if you think of the universe as a whole, there's nothing external to the universe that's constraining it. So in a sense, Zeus, as they called it, the universe, the totality, must be free. Because there's nothing preceding it or nothing outside of it that constrains it. It has a kind of absolute freedom. And we are part of a greater whole. So consider the isolation. We're not free from the rest of the universe. But the universe in its entirety has this kind of absolute freedom. Hmm. Okay. Um, there's also this book about uh, Homerus. Uh, what's it called again? The, Od the Odyssey? The Homer, the Odyssey. Yeah. 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 You like that book? I love that book. Yeah. Yeah, actually, I read it to my little girl. Yeah. I have an eight year old daughter and, and she, she loves Odysseus. Yeah. Yeah. Poppy. Um, and do you see the metaphors in there the struggle that people go through uh -huh. yeah I mean actually all the way through in the ancient world early on it was interpreted as a spiritual metaphor so Odysseus is gone for 20 years um, he's lost at sea and he tries desperately to get home to Ithaca and this has always been a metaphor for the soul's kind of homecoming and recognition recognition of its true inner nature yeah a, a kind of spiritual homecoming and, and journey, yeah. We could call it self-realization. Self-realization, the quest for self-realization. Yeah. And what is that self then? Is that the bigger self, the universal self? What self are we realizing? I think so. I mean, the, the Stoics don't talk a lot about the concept of self, but they do have this funny idea that because we're part of a bigger whole, to, to realize who we really are, we'd have to see how we fit into the bigger picture. Mm. Um, and so it would for them be about context and about seeing ourselves as part of something larger, as part of the whole of space and time. And then that's a different kind of selfhood. It's an expanded, a, a bigger sense of selfhood, which actually, interestingly, we know today in, in psychotherapy seems to be associated with uh, uh, greater psychological and em emotional resilience Um, that when people have a, a more expansive sense of self, they seem to be less easily distressed by upsetting events. Yeah, that they're not really contracted inside their body. They, yeah. they, they see the bigger picture. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so how is this for you then, traveling the world promoting your book? Isn't that stressful? It can be. Um, but, you know, it's an opportunity to practice stoicism and to kind of try and adapt to different environments. But to be honest, for most of the time, it's just fun. You know, yeah. I, I like, I love traveling and I, I love meeting different people. And I'm very lucky, I'm very privileged that I get to talk to all of these people that are interested in, in philosophy. I never dreamt when I was a young guy growing up in, in Scotland that one day I'd get to travel all over the world and, and just chat to people about my hobby and talk yeah. to them about the Odyssey and about Marcus Aurelius. So. Mainly, I just think I'm incredibly lucky. It's just fun. It brings out uh, the, the, the little boy in you. Yeah, 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 I'm grateful for it. Yeah, great. Um, anything more about Spinoza you, you love about him? I once heard him say, um, God throws a stone and the stone says, I'm flying. That was, <laughs> that, was a, that was a sentence that stuck with me. He's also a determinist. Yeah, like, so the, the, the kind of belief in our own freedom 
is a kind of a, an illusion. The philosopher Leibniz, Spinoza never said that he was a Stoic, but Leibniz said that Spinoza was uh, one of the pioneers of the new Stoicism. He called him, so he looked at me and said, you sound like a Stoic Spinoza. Why, this looks like, you know, re you're regurgitating this old philosophy of Marcus Aurelius and so on. I would, I like to say that Spinoza is kind of the swan song, the last dying breath of ancient philosophy. And it's partly because he wrote in Latin, and the Latin language, I think, partly shaped his thinking and led him to come to similar sorts of ideas as the ancient Roman thinkers did. Yeah. It led him down similar paths. I love Sp Spinoza, is such a profound thinker. He said, uh, one of my favourite sayings from him is that um, all excellent things are as difficult as they are rare, which you have to think about for a minute. But he's basically saying, look, if something's really important it w and it was really easy, then everyone would be doing it already. Like, all excellent things are as difficult as they are rare. Yeah, that stuck with you. Yeah. Um, he, back to Marcus Aurelius, he had 13 children. Yeah. With how many wives? With one wife. With one wife, 13 children. Yeah, yeah. Was that normal in that time? Yeah, it wasn't unusual in that time. Certainly, like, for a Roman noble to have a large family like that. And it, and it also, sadly, it wasn't unusual that there was a high mortality rate. Mm. And about half of those children died before he did. And, and so, you know, that, that was something that he mentions a little bit. And we know that, you know, he struggled with was having to, to witness the death, sometimes at quite an early age, of some of his own children. And he also, we should say, to put his life in context, lived through one of the most terrible plagues that's afflicted Europe. Uh, it's estimated that five million people died hmm. during what became known as the Antonine Plague after the dynasty that he was part of. And uh, we don't know for sure, but probably maybe Marcus died from the plague, quite possibly, and several of his friends and mentors probably did, and maybe some of his children died from the plague as well. Do you think he stayed faithful to his wife, or did he have side wives? Um, I think he took a concubine, if I remember rightly, after his wife died. She died a, a few years before he did. Um, but I suspect that he was faithful to her. He talks in the mid... The Meditations, his book, give us a, a, a very privileged insight into his character. Because unlike many great men who, who wrote books to create an impression, uh, the Meditations are, appear to have been his private notes... And in fact, there's certain features of the text that, that seem to indicate that they probably were never intended for publication. And, and in that book, he talks about that he took, he was glad, grateful looking back that he'd remained um, a virgin in his youth for longer than, than other young men had. He'd remained chaste and that he'd had the strength to resist um, sexual desires that he had for yeah. for certain other people. So he he was fairly self controlled and chaste. And in looking back on his life later, he felt that he felt that that had been a good thing. So um, some people say that he didn't write that book on his own. It was there was uh, another one who wrote it. What's his name again? Epictetus. Do they say that? Yeah. Uh, that he was that it was just he was just rephrasing what he oh, learned okay. from him. Um, he, he's certainly, there are some passages where he's quoting Epictetus, mm. not loads, maybe like about six or so uh, out of like several hundred. How did they think about sex, the Romans? Was it was it just as free as everyone here in Holland thinks it is? or the, Actually, the, the Stoics were known for, the, the Greeks were potentially uh, had much more liberal views about sex and the, the Stoics in particular kind of were pioneers of free love in a sense. Hmm. Um, they thought, the early Stoics thought there should be no prohibition against adultery, interestingly. And they thought that people should be able to sleep with whomever they wished. Um, and, and interestingly, we know that the Romans later tried to remove those passages from their text because Roman morality was a little bit stricter. Um, but to be honest, in his adult life, I don't feel that Marcus had much time to kind of dwell on sex. He had a lot of children. But for a lot of his reign anyway, he was probably separated from his wife and he was probably pretty preoccupied fighting this uh, this war on, yeah. the, on the northern frontier. Not a normal marriage. It wouldn't have been a normal... <laughs> it would have been this kind of military map where he was really separated a lot yeah. of the, the time. And also he was quite a sickly man. He was known for being 
quite frail. He, he, he seems to have had chronic chest and stomach pains. Mm. And uh, some, we don't know what he had, but some scholars think maybe he had chronic stomach ulcers. And he was known for being quite physically frail. Um, How old did he get? Uh, oh gosh, let me think now. He, I think he reached round about sixty, oh, if I remember rightly, which wasn't too bad. No, and certainly, time. the time that he lived, um, s- several of his friends and associates died at a slightly younger age yeah. than he did. Average age would be forty or forty-five or something. Probably during the plague and the wars. Yeah, yeah I went down, and it would have been about that. When I take a look at uh, at you and then I look at him on the book, I see quite some similarities. Do you want to be Marcus Aurelius? Yeah, I don't think I started off. I think I started to turn into him. <laughs> like, I've started to Yeah, with the beard and, and uh, yeah, you don't have the curly hair, but you, you... Yeah, my hair needs to be a bit curlier. I, I, I do look up to him as a role model. You know, he's one yeah. of my favourite philosophers. And certainly, I, like, I try... One of the things that the Stoics teach is that we should find role models and we should try and figure out what we can learn from mm-hmm. them and emulate Marcus's role model was his adoptive father, who was his predecessor as emperor, the emperor Antoninus Pius. And he says he views himself, uh, even 10 years after Antoninus had died, Marcus says he views himself as a disciple of his father and and trying to really study him and learn what he can imitate from him as a a man and as an emperor. So, yeah, I I feel that role modelling people that we look up to, almost that's something that's been forgotten in modern society. People have as their heroes um, celebrities and reality TV stars. Influencers. It's not really clear what positive traits they're actually learning from or emulating. It's almost like people haven't really thought about what's admirable. I think it's just the success that they admire rather than the character sometimes Mm. of the the people that they they spend most time thinking about. Whereas Marcus has spent a lot more time carefully choosing his role models and asking himself what it was about their character that he actually admired. You could say that your father is your biggest role model. Did did your father die at a young age? Yeah, my father died in in his 50s and and I was about 13 when he passed Hmm. away. That could explain that you look for uh, another role model. Yeah, definitely. I think that's part of it. You know, I, I was conscious that when he passed away, I started to to get into philosophy and and into studying uh, religious literature. Mm. I read all the world well, religions, the Vedanta, um, uh, the Tao Te Ching, uh, the Gnostic scriptures, yeah. you know, kind of looking for something. I read Plato at that time, but it took me a long time after completing my degree in philosophy at Aberdeen University in Scotland. It was after I finished that and went through all this process before I finally came to the Stoics. Because you don't normally study Stoicism in most undergraduate philosophy degrees. So then after I left university, I found the Stoics and suddenly it just clicked for me. And I, I thought, this seems to satisfy the, the need that I'm looking for. And that was over 20 years ago. Hmm. And I, I am still kind of still in love with Stoicism, I guess. It's yeah. obviously fit, fitted uh, just what I was looking for. So never a doubt, never that you took a look at um, cynicism or... Not uh, so far, no. <laughs> I... I've not been tempted. Um, and you know, the funny, when I got into Stoicism, it wasn't uh, as popular. There were only a handful of books about it. So I've seen this popular explosion. research and explosion yeah. in it su- subsequent to, to that. Yeah, there are some people in, in Holland who make a podcast about it. Uh-huh. Is there an explanation why it fits so good in this day and age? Uh-huh. Well, uh, we mentioned earlier some of the things about you know a secular alternative to Christianity or a Western alternative to Buddhism. I think the other thing is, you know, maybe sometimes people say, look, this philosophy that encourages us to remain committed to our values while becoming accepting of things beyond our control helps people to cope with the challenges of a world in which they're bombarded with information through social media and the internet about world and global events that are way beyond their individual ability to to influence so it's about, Stoicism gives us a way of dealing with that without screaming at the television, yeah. but nevertheless also not becoming disillusioned and passive, of reconciling commitment to value-driven action with emotional acceptance of the, the limits of our sphere of control. Hmm. Thank you. That was a great uh, wrap-up for, for on the part of uh, Stoicism. I, I, I uh, read once on a website... 
um, that we also have to realize that everything we are now owning or sitting in is falling apart. Uh -huh. That this house <laughs> won't be here in 100 years, this body will dissolve, this body, this paper will go, this video. And sometimes when I, w we think we are here for a thousand years, but it, it, it's just all dissolving. At birth you are on your way to death. Is that um, also a big part of, of, of this philosophy? It's very similar to what the Stoics in general say, and particularly Marcus Aurelius. I, if I remember rightly, there is actually a passage in the Meditations where he says, don't kid yourself that you're going to live for a thousand years. It's like we, we all are in denial of our own mortality. Yeah. And we, want, we want to pretend that it's almost as if we're going to go on living indefinitely. But the Stoics have this idea of impermanence, and part of that is our own impermanence and the impermanence of other people so they want to in a very coolly rational way come to terms and bear in mind the fact of their own mortality and the uncertainty of their future for marcus in a way it's easier interestingly because this roman emperor and he talks a lot about this he can look at his predecessors and a good example as i mentioned earlier he knew hadrian the more famous Roman emperor when, when Marcus was a young boy. I think Hadrian died when Marcus was around about 15 years old. Now as a grown man, as emperor himself, Marcus look at, could look around and say, I remember Hadrian, what he was actually like. I went boar hunting with him and things when I was a young guy. Now all that are left of him are statues and stories in history books. He's like a historical era. like And now... You know, the guys that I talk to about him, some of the young officers under my command have never even met the living Hadrian. They only know him as statues and stories and history books. And he would then be able to say, well, and you know, one day they're going to say the same thing about me. They're going to talk about the reign of Marcus Aurelius as if it was a period in ancient history. And I, I think he would remind himself of that frequently. And it, it was easy to do because and he, it brought responsibility then yeah he know he knew he had to do the right thing he had to do the right thing and he also realized um that he couldn't control the future and he could he didn't even have a, he was very aware of the limits of his control also as emperor he couldn't just do what he liked um, and he, easily if he made a misstep he would be assassinated or there would yeah. be a, an uprising against him anyway scary place to be um, he says in the meditations that he should be satisfied if he can move one small step at a time, as long as he's moving in the right direction towards his, his true values. So how come the Roman Empire uh, f fell apart? Oh, that's a big question. I mean, nobody knows for sure the answer, but, but one theory um, is that the Romans weren't able to protect uh, frontiers. They overexpanded. Maybe if Marcus had been able to follow through his plan and create two new provinces of Sarmatia and Germania, like he would have been able to stabilize the northern frontier. But after he died, his son Commodus said, I'm not hanging around here. It's too dangerous like on the frontier. There's plague in the army camps. We could get overrun by barbarians at any time. I'm going back to Rome where it's safer and they've got hot and cold running water. Yeah, grapes. Yeah, they've got grapes. <laughs> they've got uh, gladiatorial games. And so Commodus, having lost the trust of the army and the Senate, did what many Roman emperors did. And in order to maintain his authority, he became like a celebrity. So it's almost like a moral for our times. He became like a reality TV star. He threw money at putting on games and celebrations because he wanted the people to love him, um, even though he hadn't done anything to deserve their, their respect. The modern day influencer. He was a sellout. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like an influencer maybe in some ways. For who is this book? Who should buy this book? Well, I mean, anyone that's interested in Marcus Aurelius or the meditations, which is a, quite a lot of people, mm -hmm. right? I, I like to think that for some of those people, they'll get twice as much out of the meditations once they read about his life and the, the structure of the philosophy that's underlying it. And, and also, I think for people maybe that haven't come across Stoicism, that might be looking for a philosophy of life, um, like we mentioned earlier, maybe a Western alternative to Buddhism, for instance, this would be a, a good introduction to it. I like to say, imagine, I, I feel very privileged, like I'm just introducing people to something that I know is, is really awesome. It would be like if someone said they were interested in English literature, but they'd never heard of Shakespeare. 
and and I, all I was doing was saying you should check out Hamlet. It's like yeah, it's pretty good. I feel like that with Marcus Aurelius. Mm. Like I, I have no qualms about selling the philosophy. It's one of the the all time classics of self help and spiritual philosophy. So almost anyone that's introduced to to his book will come away thinking there's some profound stuff in it. And I'm just like a curating that or introducing people to it, which I, I feel is an easy job to do. Yeah. And your tattoo, does that have anything to do with uh, uh, earlier times, uh, Roman Empire, uh, Greek uh, stuff? Well, this is a, it, this is Celtic, uh, ah, Scottish, yeah. a Celtic uh, design. It's a dragon. And uh, it was my little girl, my daughter, Poppy. I asked her what sort of tattoo I should get. And she said, get a dragon daddy. Because one of her favourite stories is an English folk story called The Lampton Worm, about a knight that fights a dragon. And I would tell her that story every night. And when I was telling her, I wove in lots of little anecdotes about Greek philosophy alongside this uh, English myth about a dragon. Yeah. And so that's kind of what it means to me. But it was something that she chose for me. Oh, nice. Um, you could see all those stories about all those ancient heroes um, as a metaphor for the struggle that everyone goes to. Mm -hmm. eh? You, As a child, everything is al allowed if, you, if you're in a nice household. Yeah, you get really self-conscious, you get um, in this sexual drive, eh? you have to uh, get the attention of the other sex. And then around, as in my story, around an age of 40, you get to think about, oh, it's not about gaining, it's about giving. And then you, then things that were aborted, let's say 10, 15 years ago, aren't important anymore. Do you see any similarities in the story of the life of Marcos Aurelius for that, that, that applies to everyone? Everyone growing up, reaching old age. I think so. I mean, he went through a number of transformations in his life. You know, he started off, he, you know, he, interestingly, he wasn't perfect. He tells us himself that he struggled with his temper as a young man. He was angry. He was angry. And I don't know why, but, you know, maybe it might have been connected with the loss of his father at a very early age. And one of the things he was angry about was the kind of pretentiousness and the, 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 the superficial nature of life at court under Hadrian, who was surrounded by these sycophants and sophists. Marcus couldn't tolerate that. Like he thought they were all phonies and he didn't want to be any part of it. And I think he was only really ultimately persuaded to become emperor because Antoninus Pius showed him there was another way of ruling where he could live more simply, more honestly and more down to earth, even though he was in the imperial palace. Hmm. There's a really a self-improvement hype going on over here in the Netherlands. Everybody wants to make the best version of their self. Is is that is that? Um, do do people find a lot of worthy information in this book to make the best version of their themselves? Yeah, I mean that really is at the heart of Stoicism. It's very much self-improvement in that sense. Hmm. That the Stoics say the goal of like all ancient philosophies in Greek and, and Roman times were understood in terms of how they defined the goal of life, the most important thing in life, the meaning of the life. meaning of life. And so the Stoics, they say the meaning of life is arete, um, which we translate as virtue, but really it means excellence of character, like realizing your potential in life. Yeah. The Stoics said it's like we're a piece of half finished poetry. Nature has handed us the ability to use reason in daily life, but we do it badly. And we have a kind of duty to ourselves to use thought, consciousness and reason to the best of our ability. And if we did that, we'd become wise. And if we became wise, we'd become virtuous and if we'd have excellence of character. We'd be fully realized human beings. They said no one like that has ever existed, but that we should try and imagine what someone might be like if they existed hmm. and they f used reason to its full potential in their daily lives. So make the most beautiful painting you can make of yourself. Yeah, that's a good way of putting it. Yeah. yeah. And for who or what do we do that then? Sometimes I think, well, it's all pointless. I'm, you know, it's what they say also, what you say in your book, uh -huh. people are not going to talk about you. Maybe the, the, a few months when you're gone and then everybody has forgotten that there was someone uh -huh. like isn't it all just a fight against mortality, making books, making interviews, making podcasts, because we, we know that it's so, it's, it's, it's just a spark. It's easy to become a nihilist. Yeah. You might look at the Stoics and think, doesn't this point towards nihilism? Yeah. There's a, this aspect of it that's all about 
viewing things as small in the grand scheme of things and trivial, but strangely they arrive at the opposite conclusion. They think the things that befall us, the setbacks that we experience in a sense are small and trivial, but that virtue isn't. And I think that again goes back to Socrates. It's this idea that we already come into the world pursuing certain goals. We're already trying, it, but the very fact that we're self-aware and we use language and reason, we're trying to grasp the truth. Yeah. And Socrates and the Stoics, I think, would say that anyone that tries to reason implicitly is committed, whether they realise it or not, to trying to reason well. There's no point reasoning badly. No. If you reason at all, at some level you want to do it properly, you want to get to the truth if yeah. you're thinking about the world at all. And the Stoics would say as soon as you really grasp that and realise it, then the implication is that we have a duty to ourselves to attain a kind of enlightenment or wisdom. You know, that's the fundamental universal obligation that we really have. And that leads us to the Stoic I ideal of, of wisdom. Yeah. How do they view desire? They thought um, that most of our desires in life are kind of misguided in a sense um, because they thought that by nature, first of all, we're corrupted by the influence of society mm -hmm. into desiring things that we don't really need iPhone. They, yeah, like they were very aware of that, but even in the ancient yeah. world, right? But they'd look at us and think, oh, you guys are even worse. Well, <laughs> you've been corrupted even more than we have. You're all trying to get things that aren't really going to make you happy. We kind of confuse the means with the end. So like somebody who, who kind of ends up craving money for its own sake, the Stoics would say money's only a value insofar as you can use it yeah. to achieve other things that are more fundamentally important. In itself, it's just pieces of paper or numbers on a computer screen. It's not worth anything. Hmm. So they said, you guys get sucked into this narrow perspective where you kind of confuse the instrument or the tool for the goal that you're trying to achieve. Hmm. And if you ask yourself deeper and deeper, what is the goal? It's wisdom, enlightenment. And maybe sometimes money could help you get that or sometimes mm -hmm. it might actually get in the way of getting it. But you need to take a step back and reappraise your fundamental values in order to, to realise what things you should be desiring. So the wise person's desires are different because they're shaped by this broader perspective that he or she has. And they think one of the traps that we fall into is, is uh, desiring to avoid pain and desiring to experience pleasure in a kind of crudely hedonistic way. And uh, the Stoics thought that that's a mistake because sometimes we have to endure pain in order to become healthier and strengthen our character or strengthen our body. So their classic example would be you might go to the dentist or the doctor and voluntarily endure pain because you know that it's, it's going to make things health. better. Yeah. So life is not about becoming happy all the time. No, no. But see, the thing is that the word happiness used to mean something different. What did it mean? Not a lot of people know that. Like it meant uh, good fortune or flourishing or well-being. And then the word, like many words, became corrupted over time into just feeling good, feeling happy. Yeah. So it went from the real thing to kind of the illusion of genuine happiness. It's still in our language. In English, we say hapless, which means unfortunate and would be the opposite of the original meaning of happy, which would be fortunate or lucky. So the, the Stoics, it, the word for the goal, one of the words for the goal of life, eudaimonia, that's very important in Greek philosophy. It means flourishing or well-being. It used to be translated as happiness, but now I think that's a very uh, unfortunate kind of misleading translation hmm. because people assume then that the goal is a sort of subjective feeling and the Stoics would say, no, 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 the, the, those feelings are, are kind of misleading. Um, you, we need to get the, the real deal, real health, real enlightenment, real well-being, not just a feeling of uh, pleasure or happiness. Yeah. And what about worrying? Well, you know, that's the modern malady, isn't it? We do uh, we do a lot of it. Marcus Aurelius was a warrior, actually. Not only a warrior, but also a worrier. He was a warrior <laughs> and a warrior. Yeah. Um, we know from his private letters he kind of worried and he had problems sleeping, but he used stoicism as a way of helping him to, to cope with that and overcome it. Uh, worry is one of the areas of modern psychology that I'm most interested in. And let me go back right to something we said at the beginning. Mm -hmm. Maybe that, this would be a good opportunity to do it. People who worry fail to distinguish clearly 
between aspects of the emotion that are involuntary and aspects that are voluntary. So when you talk to people about emotions, they'll go, surely it's involuntary. Like they get quite confused. So when someone gets anxious, the initial feeling of the heart racing or the muscles tensing might be, they've, A, they've already happened to you, right? and B, they're not entirely under your direct voluntary control, yet nevertheless people try to block them from their mind, to suppress them with drugs or alcohol, to kind of force themselves to relax. So they struggle against these automatic or reflex-like or involuntary feelings. And then they ignore the voluntary aspects of worry. Now, people have some control over the amount of time, for instance, that they spend dwelling on their worries or the questions that they pose to themselves or the conversations that they have in their head. And we know that a good way of illustrating that is that most people, when they're lying in bed at night, if they start to worry about something, have the ability to say, I'll need to think about this tomorrow. But some people who suffer from pathological worry will be up all night. Right? But it's normal to set aside worries if you're trying to sleep, if you're in a conversation with someone mm. else, or you're engaged in some other situation. Mm. There'll be bits of the thought, automatic thoughts that pop into your mind, but you can choose not to dwell on those because it's not an appropriate time to do it. But some people are forgetful of that and just allow themselves to get on the train. train of thought. Yeah. So learning that we have actually some voluntary control over certain aspects of the worry is important, while also learning to be detached and indifferent and accepting towards the automatic thoughts that initially pop into our mind to make a more nuanced distinction yeah. between different aspects of the experience. Okay. So can we wrap up uh, Stoicism in living in agreement with nature? Yeah. That's their slogan. Uh, <laughs> yeah, they had a slogan on a... <laughs> yeah, they had like a slogan where you could print it on a t-shirt or something. <laughs> and it, it symbolizes a lot of things. It would take a little while to unpack it. But they, so it's, it's kind of obscure, but they meant two things by it, they, is one way of explaining it. So they meant we have to live in agreement with our own true nature as human beings ah. by understanding what our nature is, mm -hmm. understanding that we're special because we have self-awareness language and thought and so we should live in agreement with that nature by fulfilling its potential using reason to the best of our ability to live rationally and therefore to become wise and there's another sense in which they thought we should live in agreement with external nature the stuff that happens to us by not complaining about it the weather they, not yeah the weather the environment other people by not allowing ourselves to become bitter are resentful about things that happen to us, but kind of the say treating it almost like someone in the gymnasium, um, sparring with a, a, a partner in wrestling. Um, so you the the Marcus says you you don't get angry like if he wrestles you to the goal yeah. and you get cuts and bruises. You just think it's part of the deal, and that's how we should view events that befall us in life. Why it really is just an opportunity to strengthen our character rather than things that we should complain about. Yeah. Okay, the book is uh, in the Dutch stores everywhere, I can imagine. Um, there's some more stuff of you on uh, on uh, YouTube. Yeah, I've got a lot of videos on YouTube yeah. and the podcasts and things. And Podcasts, there's a lot of interesting interviews. Uh, one final question. How would the Stoicists look at, or how do the Stoicists look at Brexit? It, 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 it gives a lot of people a lot of trouble, it seems. Oh man, that's a whole can. There's, you know you've really opened the can of worms. So I'm going to try and forced myself to give a short answer yeah. to that because the Stoics were also known for being what we call ethical cosmopolitans and that meant that they believed that all humans regardless of age or sex or race or gender were equal and they were one of the first schools of philosophy to talk about a brotherhood of mankind of humankind so they thought insofar as other people have the ability to think then they're like our brothers and sisters regardless of what country or race they are. So I think they would have been, in a sense, in principle, pro-European because they would have wanted to see themselves as, as part of a bigger um, unity socially and to try and foster that a sense of a larger community, which I think probably Marcus saw himself as doing through the, the Roman Empire. The barbarians might not have agreed with that. <laughs> Actually, they did. Many of the barbarians he fought against desperately wanted to be part on the inside yeah. of the, the Roman Empire. And he, he resettled thousands and thousands of them within the empire rather than enslaving them or 
or slaughtering them. So he, in a sense, was committed to this kind of political cosmopolitanism as well, embracing diversity and, and bringing people all under the same tent. Yeah. Thanks for this very interesting talk. Thank you, Patrick. It's a pleasure yeah. to speak to you today. Th thanks for visiting Holland. Cheers. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm loving Holland. Okay.